Hi everyone and welcome to Connected Learning TV. This is our second webinar in a special two month long series titled Post Connected Educator Month, A Connected Mindset. I'm John Barilloni, the Community Manager for the Connected Learning Alliance and I'll be our host for today. So throughout this series on Connected Learning TV, we're introducing you to some of the awesome insights and best practices and advice that you might have missed during this year's Connected Educator Month back in October. And if you're watching this either live or as a recording, please, please take a moment to share it with your fellow educators, especially if they didn't have the opportunity to participate during Connected Educator Month. Uh, today we're chatting specifically about the blended learning theme from Connected Educator Month and before we dive into our chat um, like we normally do here on Connected Learning TV let's just go over a, a few quick details to those that are watching live right now we really welcome your comments and questions either via the Twitter hashtag CE14 that's CE14 or via the Google Plus event page for this hangout and we'll do our best to address your questions uh, live in real time here in the Hangout. And we're also chatting throughout the month in the Connected Learning Google Plus community. So before we begin, I'd like to give all our guest speakers a chance to introduce themselves. So going from my left to right, Adina, do you want to start us off? Sure, sure. So my name is Adina Sullivan, and I'm an ed tech coordinator for a district in uh, near San Diego, San Marcos Unified, in North San Diego County. And we're working with teachers who are getting started with the idea of blended learning and what it really means, as well as what it means to really be a connected educator. Perfect. And Brian? Uh, Brian Bridges. i um, recently retired uh, educator of 38 years, spent 20 years in middle school, loving every single minute of it, uh, teaching computers and having students write and uh, share their stories via email. It was terrific. I spent the last seven years directing C-Learn, the California Learning Resource Network. It was there that we merged, not merged, but there that we collaborated with Q to create the e-learning strategy symposium. Um, and that's where our involvement with blended learning comes from. So I'm happily retired, happily directing the e-learning symposium and consulting. Thanks for having me. And thanks for taking time out of your retirement. I'm sure it's not easy to always pull yourself away from uh, the couch there. And as we see, you're on the couch. So that's perfect kind of informal conversation environment we love to have here. And up next is Mike. And Mike, if you want to kind of talk about all the different connections to Q that we have going on in this webinar too. Absolutely, and I want to throw down a challenge to Brian's definition of retirement because uh, I, I haven't really seen him slow down uh, since this supposed retirement. So just in any case, uh, my name is Mike Lawrence, and I am CEO of Q. I'm coming up on my 10th year as, uh, as the chief executive of my favorite nonprofit, and uh, really thrilled to be invited. Thank you for having me. And just to uh, shout out about the two folks that have already been introduced, to let you know uh, what they do on top of their um, day jobs. It, Adina is the chair of Q's communications committee, and uh, Brian was a past president of the organization. He actually served on the board and rose to the level of president, so we're, we're thrilled with that. And uh, the gentleman that's about to introduce himself is our current co-chair of the e-learning um, network, the e-learning network. We used to call it the e-learning SIG for special interest group, but uh, in any case, I'll let him introduce himself, but I just want to make sure that uh, you guys knew that uh, Q is the uh, the nonprofit that uh, that brings the, the four of us together fairly regularly, so thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Mike, and last but not least, Rob. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I'll just add to what Mike just said. You know, it was about, oh, I don't know, what, a month and a half ago that Mike kind of sent an email out to several of us and says, hey, Connected Educator Month, they want somebody to lead the blended learning strand. What do you think? Should we do it? And of course I said, yes, we should, because I just say, you know, it's important for all of us to get the information out, and Q's done such a great job of that. So, um, so a little bit about myself. So I'm a lifelong educator in California. Um, I currently work as an adjunct professor at CSU Fresno and I'm a co-founder of the Blended Teacher Network and do most of my time as a consultant for blended and online learning. I, if I could, I wanted just to share a few slides. It's 
this was the Q logo that we had with the Connected Educator Month, so I just wanted to show that to you. When we talk about blended learning, we pose this question to people. We said, when you see, think about blended learning, is it students controlling their own learning path? Is it online tools used in face-to-face -face classrooms? Is it a change in teaching pedagogy? Is it putting lesson plans online? Or all of the above? And most people would say all of the above, but from where I sit, it's really more about how you change your teaching pedagogy and how it better personalizes learning for students. Um, kind of along those lines, when we talk about blended learning, we realize that a definition is important for research, it's important in professional development, and if you're going to implement blended learning, you kind of have to know what it is before you do it. Um, this slide from uh, the Christensen Institute says, you know, it's nice to have a textbook tech rich classroom, but it does not necessarily equal blended because it's good to have digital whiteboards and computers on kids' desks, but how you use those is really the blended piece. And we know that all of teaching and learning has to do with the student, the teacher, and the content, and any one of those things is pretty complex in itself. So the Christensen Institute has put forth this definition that most of the field has now adapted and adopted, and I'll let you read it on your own. Um, the final part, one of the webinars we did as part of Connected Educator Month, Heather Staker talked about this definition, and she talked about this modality piece, the very last part of their definition, as being something where it's totally integrated with students' learning. In other words, they're not going to a computer lab to do something separate than what's in the classroom. That's what true blended learning is when it's all integrated together. So overall, it's important to also realize that blended learning involves all of these different concepts. I call put forth this blended learning roadmap, and it involves all of these aspects to make it successful. And one of the things that the Q organization is doing in California to help make things successful is to put on the annual e-learning strategy symposium coming up in December. So anybody who's listening in, you can still register, and I'm sure that Brian will talk a little bit more about that later on as we go along. So, John, thanks for letting me kind of insert that part. Well, that's a perfect setup, Rob. So going back real quick to you, you had mentioned Connect Educator Month and your particular involvement in that. And I wanted to get a sense from the rest of the group here. Uh, I know you were all involved in the blended learning theme and some of the events that were happening throughout Connected Educator Month. And you know, in your own words, how do you feel about you know, the importance of the mission and goal and vision of connecting educators together. Why is that important? Why have we kind of seen that ramping up over the past few years? And how have you seen the needle moving on that particular mission? And, and again, anyone feel free to jump in. Oh, I would love to start. Um, having a community of fellow educators come together to share what they're doing has been at the core of change. And that's why Q was created 30-something years ago. You know, I joined Q in 1983 and immediately saw this was the only place where people were coming together and sharing uh, what they were doing in the classroom, where we could steal other people's ideas, uh, where we could bounce things off of each other. And over the years, you know, that conference grew to be enormous because uh, of the spread of this influence. Uh, we've seen networks like that across the country, whether it's INA Cole or Connected Educator, having lots of little places to go where you can study and share your particular skills or your particular needs uh, is essential. Uh, and of course, Mike, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Well, no, it's a perfect fit and it, and it leads into what I was thinking about as well in that uh, our choice of leading the blended learning theme uh, fit in nicely with it because uh, when you are connecting in these, in these professional learning networks, uh, these personal learning networks, you are embodying and you're modeling blended learning, right? So Because we, we have these face-to-face -face conferences where we go and meet, and then we keep the conversation going using social media and other tools, and um, that is modeling blended learning. We're learning face-to-face -to -face together, and then we go off and we learn more in these uh, environments that are sometimes structured, but more often not unstructured. And it's that informal learning that continues beyond the face-to-face -face that I think is really powerful and um, is indicative of blended learning at the core. So I, I see it as sort of blended for professional development. So that's why it's a fit. That's why it seemed like a fit uh, for Q to jump in and take a leadership role. 
Yeah, in fact, I'll just jump in and say, Brian, I hadn't really thought about the personal learning network perspective um, and thinking about connected educators and blended learning, but it's certainly been through organizations like Q that have brought all of us together. Um, I think I interacted with Adina online for, I don't know, several months in some ways, and then all of a sudden saw her in person at a conference, and then, you know, we've connected in a variety of ways in that way, and so that all of those things together is really the power of connected educators, the power of Q, and the power of blended learning, all of that stuff together. You know, and just to add to that, I think it's um, so often there were a lot of teachers who were doing things in their classroom um, and wanting to make change but feeling very isolated, and the model was that we were just talking to one another in our in our teams, in our schools, um, and really needed to move past that. So there were a few of us in my area who started to do that, and now teachers are really, really seeing how important it is to go outside their little bubble, that it's not just the PD that they're sent to or they choose to go to in a face-to-face -face environment, but it does take some, some time and some effort and some work um, to go beyond that and look to see what else is happening out there, what are people doing, um, what are some ideas that look great or they look great but maybe wouldn't work in your environment and kind of testing those things out. So I think the idea is really growing uh, and I think as, as political shifts with education move, it's making that even more apparent that, that educators need to get outside the little bubble and really connect to others um, and, and it really is a, a blended environment of the face-to-face -face with what you're doing at your own time and pace and changing that pedagogy in your classroom. So speaking of all these different uh, opportunities that educators now have to connect with each other, whether it's through you know, virtual exchanges or whether it's through activities like the ones that were happening during Connected Educator Month, do the four of you have any uh, stories about particular light bulb moments or aha moments you saw from people participating during CEM that um, kind of stood out to you? Any, any stories to share there? Well, I'll jump in with that one. I, I think uh, probably the first aha I had was um, how many more people were involved in connector, Connected Educator Month this year than in past years. Um, we, we tried to run a blended learning Twitter chat a couple different times, and it was a very crowded space um, during the time period. So, you know, we didn't end up running that because there was so much other stuff happening all at the same time. So we would just, you know, uh, participate in those other tweet chats. So it was exciting to see the number of people involved in those tweet chats. At one of the point, one point, um, you know, Arnie Duncan was in there as part of the tweet chat. So it's just the range of people that can participate are kind of the ongoing ahas, I think, of Connected Educator Month in a variety of different ways. So um, I'll just leave it at that and see what other people thought. You know, to, to add to that, um, you know, years ago it was everyone looked at me funny if I said, oh, I learned this new thing. And they'd say, oh, don't tell us you learned it online. Don't tell us you learned it from Twitter. Don't tell us you learned it at this conference you went to. And now in the PD sessions we're doing, people are begging, how do we get out there and learn more? How do we connect? So gone from, you know, being the prize of, oh, how could you do that? It's so weird to show us how to do that. We, we want to get on there. And it's just, it's such an amazing change. I'll add that one of my aha moments was the fact that uh, uh, Connected Educator Month was not just the U.S. There was there was some hashtags specific to other countries that were being engaged and impacted by the efforts that I had no idea that, that they were going to be uh, involved. So that was that was a fun aha. And the other uh, the other one actually immediately preceded uh, Connected Educator Month. It was when Q produced the uh, first online summit featuring Google for Education back in September. It was a couple weeks before and uh, Adina was there and I think a few others uh, maybe watching were there and it used this tool, Google Hangouts on Air. And We were running through the, the brilliance of Steve Hargadon and Lucy Gray, our partners for the event, um, four rooms simultaneously and then we would go into big breakout rooms for the keynotes and uh, it was our first real big foray into blended professional development. The idea that you could have something happen remotely in real time and engage people that previously I, I had only seen at face-to-face -face events. And so that was part of the thing that uh, really got us excited. We had already committed and, and, and asked to be the, 
the theme leader for blended learning at that point, but uh, that really cemented it for me. And um, for the week and in the, in the month following that, I was very excited and encouraged by the potential of uh, remote synchronous professional learning um, using the tools that we keep talking about. So uh, it, it, it was doable, and um, we got a lot of positive feedback from it. We learned a lot. We're gonna we're gonna do it again, but we've, we're gonna change you know some of the things that we did just to make it even smoother for the attendees and for the participants and the presenters. So really excited by that, uh, and and that one really for me just sort of rolled right into the Connected Educator Month. That's perfect. So I know in particular talking about the theme for blended learning and Connected Educator Month, one of the big focuses was um, what does effective blended learning look like or what does good blended learning look like. So I was wondering if the four of you here could kind of distill down maybe some of the bigger nuggets that came out of those conversations. What does effective blended learning look like in you know, today's classrooms? So let me jump in with that and say that it, it was at a Q conference about three years ago when Michael Horn from the Christensen Institute was keynote, keynoting and he was sharing that definition of blended learning, the first iteration. And I, I was on Twitter at the same time tweeting what was going on and that sort of thing and somebody tweeted out and said, oh, our teachers are putting their lesson plans online, we're doing blended learning. And I went, oh no, it's more than that, it's more than that. And so part of, of I think the blended learning strand for Connected Educator Month was helping people understand that it's not just being online but it's the it's what happens between the teacher and the student that personalizes learning and so that part to me was was really the exciting part as far as thinking about blended learning and, and to do that it's not just like going online and bookmarking a website. It's not just emailing somebody. It's much more than that. And when, when educators really connect with kids, then learning changes and kids become more engaged in their learning. And that's really what blended learning is all about from my perspective. You know, the funny thing about every revolution is that sometimes the words get co-opted. You know, like the word blended right now. It has a specific meaning by Michael and several different definitions of what blended can be from rotation, you know, down to you know, a la carte, uh, but you know, my fear right now is that people will do anything and say, well, we're blending right now, uh, we're word, we're word processing something right now, or we're, you know, we're printing something out. Um, how will we know if it's effective? Um, there are a lot of studies happening right now, but the revolution is so incredibly young. You know, we only passed the tipping point for blended learning about two years ago. Uh, and we're still at a very low percentage, even though a high percentage of districts res uh, respond that they have teachers doing some kind of online or blended learning, the numbers are still fairly low compared to where Michael Horn and Heather Staker think it'll be by 2019. So we do have to study that. But blended learning cannot be effective, as Rob was saying, unless there's some kind of end in mind, unless students have some kind of choice whether the learning is authentic things like that. You you really have to have that end in mind and plan out what you're doing. You just can't say, well, we're going to word process or you know, I'm going to post a video online and say, well, this is blended or I'm impacting my students' learning. It has to be much more than that. Uh, no, I know for, no, I, sorry, Mike. Go I know ahead. for our district when uh, we, we started getting into the whole idea of blended learning uh, it kind of came with uh, testing out some one-to-one -one opportunities. And for us, it was more that we knew we needed to assess it, and what everyone thought assessment was going to mean was test scores. And that's not what we wanted. That's not what we were looking at. And we were looking at uh, how students uh, change in terms of their academics, their academic language. We have a high uh, population of uh, low-income second language learners who wanted to make sure to address. And we, we looked at how it was really changing things in the classroom and we found that part students participating in classrooms that were doing a blended learning environment they had higher academic language they were able to not just use the words but actually use them effectively make that put them into use we had students who felt more that the the, the curriculum was personalized for them even though it wasn't uh, as explicitly personalized as it probably should have been, they still felt that it was personalized for them and they, they had more input and more say into it. They also felt uh, better about lessons being uh, more cross-curricular. 
and uh, feeling that it wasn't just, you know, it's these 45 minutes we're doing math and these 45 minutes we're doing science, but things were, were combining better and they were able to make real effective use of their knowledge and that was a huge difference. So uh, for us when we looked at it, it was more than just, you know, how well do they do on the assessment, it's how well are they doing in all of these other areas as well. I was just going to add that um, you should, in terms of effective blended learning, I think it should always start with the student needs and the, and the curricular goals. So you want to make sure that you're best addressing the curricular goal with the tool that you're using. And if you, know, you don't want to use technology for its own sake. So if uh, engaging in a synchronous discussion with the author of a book helps you better understand or better explain that, uh, then, then absolutely that, that, that satisfies that test. Um, if you're using PowerPoint slides instead of writing on a uh, whiteboard, does that necessarily enhance it? Uh, does, does the fact that you might put slides up and post them on the web for the students to look at later, maybe you're getting closer because then they can look at it you know, at a different time. But you've know, you got to analyze why you're using technology, why you're blending to make sure that it's effective. And so I think if it passes, passes that test, if it's, if it's focused on the student goal, the goal of the curricular uh, project or activity, um, then you're in a much better place to, to say that it's effective. Um, there's also tools out there as well. There's, there's another organization that uh, Rob mentioned earlier, INACOL. Uh, I think Brian mentioned it as well. They're the International uh, Association for Online and Blended Learning, and they have standards that you can, you can look at to help you understand what quality online and blended teaching looks like and what quality online courses are. Um, they've got some really good answers to that question about effective blended learning. So I would encourage folks, if they aren't aware of INACOL, to check it out. It's at inacol.org. And um, they have an annual conference. They have uh, discussion groups. They have uh, affiliates like Q or the California Nevada affiliate for them. Um, and so there are uh, there are places where you can go to get some additional information on that. They also publish quite a lot um, in terms of best practices. So I would certainly point to them as a resource. Thanks for sharing those resources. Just keep them coming throughout, and we'll definitely make sure that uh, the archive page for this webinar has all of those listed. So we're starting to see some questions rolling in from people on Twitter and from the Q&A app on Google+. So that is great. Keep those questions and comments coming. And I did want to touch on one theme that I'm starting to see here. Um, this question about how school leaders and school admins in particular can help support these blended learning uh, experiments or blended learning implementation uh, that teachers want to do within their classroom. What kind of support infrastructure needs to be in place before teachers can kind of start down the blended learning path? So I'll jump in with that one and then Brian you can follow up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so you know many people have looked at you know what does it take to implement good and, and I'll go back 20 years, you know, when we first started implementing just computer use in schools is, you know, it takes more than, you know, one teacher can do it. Let me just put it, put that out. One teacher can really put all those tools together and we can um, make that work. But in reality, if you really want to implement it across your school or across a school district so that it, it really impacts student learning, then there are those six elements that need to, to occur. You got to have good leadership. You've got to have ongoing professional development, and not the type that I remember when I was in school. You know, you'd be brought into a big auditorium, I mean, we'd have a speaker, and then we'd be told, "Now go out and do it." Well, you know, that's not what great professional development is. Um, third, um, teachers and teacher um, teaching is very important. And then third, having the systems in place to implement that. And then the technology backbone and the infrastructure and then the content that belongs along those lines. So all of those things together are important to implement blended learning. Um, this is Brian. I would say the, the worst thing an administrator could do would be to buy lots of stuff. Um, in the beginning of, of any tech revolution, whether it's the 80s, 90s, or even now, uh, it begins in the classroom with the teacher with a really good idea. Maybe they've read about something or saw it in a conference or learned it in their personal learning network. Uh, flipped classrooms come to mind. That started very humbly 
and then grew exponentially. They even have their own conference right now. Our conference, the eLearning Strategy Symposium, is all about online and blended learning. Q's annual and fall conference have specific strands to blended learning. That happens at a, at a teacher level. But over, over a period of time, if you're really going to support it, you have to have some kind of leadership plan in place. And the best administrators, and there are many superintendents across the state, they create basically a technology plan or a learning plan for where they want to go over the next two to three years. Uh, the Evergreen Education Group, uh, their annual report, Keeping Pace, uh, which is at kpk12.org, they designed a really nice um, set of timelines for districts to use to create a plan for them uh, for that district to begin to uh, implement online or blended learning. Following that kind of template, then you create systemic change where all stakeholders are involved. That's how you create massive change. Otherwise, it's teachers on the ground level changing their own classrooms, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want all students to grow, then you really have to have that systemic change. I would, I would agree with that. Um, and just in my own experience in my classroom, um, you know, 20 odd years ago, um, I, you know, at the time we didn't have a network at the school site. We didn't have phones in these classrooms. And so I um, brought a computer in and I ran a phone line from the staff lounge. I swear there was already a hole drilled in my wall. I, I was not me. And then I threaded it through, plugged it into the back of my, you know, 14 for baud modem and dialed up AOL and so my classroom was online and we were able to uh, engage with you know the internet of the time which in this case was AOL and so I was trying to open up that door uh, the point that I would make though is that that systemic change that Brian referenced is essential to expand and to scale that up so it's not just one crazy English teacher you know two doors down from the teachers lounge hoping that no one gets a phone call that disrupts my connection to AOL um, to be able to expand that out you need to have the vision, you need to have that systemic plan. One of the things I like to point out often that's missed uh, in those ready, ready, fire, aim scenarios where an administrator finally gets funding to implement technology um, is uh, the typical rule of thumb when you get funding to implement for technology is a third on hardware instead of 100% on hardware. So, oh, I can buy this many iPads or this many Chromebooks or I can buy this many, you know, whatever the, the device of the day is. You should only really spend about a third of your money on that. A third you should spend on professional development training for the actual staff as well as um, classified as well as certificated. And then the final third is infrastructure. Make sure you've got the bandwidth, you've got the power outlets, that you've got the resources in line for the physical installation. When talking about blended, you've got to go even further than that. and You've got to make sure that your community understands what you're trying to accomplish before you actually purchase the devices and roll that out. You've got to make sure the community understands what's expected when they walk home with the device. You've got to be able to understand um, what, what that means. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. And I apparently have three devices connected. There we go. Um, <laughs> you've got to be able to understand what it means to share with the community and uh, make sure that you're preparing everyone for the advent of a blended learning environment. And so um, those pieces have to be taken into account. There are additionally resources for those. Uh, in addition to the organization I mentioned earlier, ISTE has a number of resources to help you implement one-to-one. -one. A great organization that Q partners with called um, Common Sense Media has resources called One-to-One -one Essentials that you could look up to see. Uh, it's all based on questions. Are you asking the stakeholders the right questions? And that's at Common Sense Media uh, and their programs called One-to-One -one Essentials, I think. Uh, it helps districts plan ahead, think about what they're, what they're going to be implementing. And then, of course, the, the PLNs, the, profession, the personal learning networks that we've been talking about. Ask your PLNs, hey, we're about to implement this program. We're about to hand a device to every student. What have you learned? What, what should I avoid? Um, share that out to the social media networks you're a part of and the organizations that you're a member of uh, to get those answers. Those are my thoughts. You know, I think there's another piece of that, too, and that's when we talk about a, a third of the money should go to PD, which is such a critical piece um, and not spending it all on the devices, the things. Uh, it's also looking at what you're doing for that PD, what you're doing as an organization, whether it's at the site level 
or at the district level is are you putting some of those same practices that you're planning to do with students, are you doing some of those same practices with your staff as well? So are you providing blended learning opportunities for professional development rather than all sit and get? Um, is, are, are, are you willing to put that into and, and see, it, see it being useful not just for students but for staff as well is that it's it's good teaching whether we're talking about adults or kids and changing that pedagogy and, and giving more opportunities and giving folks a chance to learn things at their own play, at their own pace uh, with control over where and when and all of that and that's something that's it's difficult uh, to me it actually feels like the harder piece to make happen because folks are very used to those who are in charge stand up and they present and everyone else sits and listens and then grumbles about doing whatever they're supposed to be doing and then head off to their schools when that's and you're telling them how to how to do these great things in their classrooms but if you're not using some of those with those individuals as well you, I think you're missing a bit a big piece of it so Adina kind of riffing off that a little bit and I know you're talking about teachers kind of being in this environment where they're having to learn but dialing that back down to uh, the students and how they're having to you know shift a little bit out of this traditional or more uh, formal education system that they're used to how are we seeing uh, blended learning in its various forms affecting students and how they're you know, relationships are with their teacher or their classmates or how they're dealing with having maybe an extra device to take care of. And what are some of the you know, more common themes, whether positive or negative, that you guys have seen from uh, your experience? I'll, I'll start with that. So one of the things that, that we've noticed is, and we're not... Um, we are just now testing out the idea of actually sending devices home. Um, but as far as, as students' relationships between students and students and teachers, we've had teachers come to us and say, you know, I have these students who it was very difficult to get them to participate in class. It was very difficult to get them to interact with others, and they're doing it. And I feel like I'm actually connecting with this student because they're doing it in, in, in not a real-time face-to-face environment. Students having an opportunity to go back over information if they need to, to review it, to uh, look at it in different ways before responding uh, to the teacher or to a discussion board or to their classmates when the, once they get to class. Uh, it's having a really big impact on our students who are um, struggling, students who are second language, students who are just quiet and, and aren't the ones that have their hand raised and, and constantly talking in a face-to-face -face environment and it, it's really changing that and I think that we have a lot of teachers that are, are, are really seeing the impact of allowing that extra time and pace um, and place for students uh, to really really get into the information and, and like I said, review it again if they need to or access different materials rather than feeling like they, if they didn't get it the first time, then they don't get it, and that's it. It gives them a chance to think before they have to react or respond. I think I'd like to go back to something I think Mike and Brian brought up earlier, and it talks about, uh, where they talked about this, you know, systemic change and plan. And Mike talked about the importance of keeping the importance of keeping the student in the center of all those plans of why you're doing what you're doing. So I think that's the best reminder for all of us is just you you got to keep kids in the center as you're moving forward with technology as you're moving forward with course management systems whether you're calling it blended learning or online learning or whatever term you want that student has got to stay in the center because that's the reason we're doing what we're doing you know and that's something I think many people don't quite understand about this revolution the online and blended learning revolution described by Michael and, and Clayton Christensen you just can't put the same activities online, expect them to be relevant or, or provide active engagement for students. Um, blended learning requires a pedagogical change. That requires a fair amount of professional development and planning and, yes, technology. But online and blended learning shakes up education. Uh, and so you just can't say, well, this is the latest fad. I'm going to you know, try this and call it blended. Um, you have to to rethink things from the ground up. Mike, anything to add on that particular point? 
I was trying not to be too talkative, but since you called me out, uh, I was going to say that I have um, uh, very first-hand experience in the sense that my son is, is 12, he's a seventh grader, and uh, this is the first year we've really seen uh, teachers um, embrace technology um, that he has. And he has one teacher in particular that uh, jumped on board the Google Classroom as soon as they launched it this summer. And it's been exciting watching him um, get, you know, get onto a Chromebook and log in and, and continue working on a document he started at school and then share it with me and then we're printing and I'm able to see it and advise him. And so he's feeling empowered. It's one kid. It's one one kid kid's experience, but um, you know, it's so fun watching that firsthand after being you know in this industry and, and working with educators and being a teacher myself for so long. To finally see uh, it happen in my own house is uh, really exciting. He's he's uh, able to sh uh, shoot messages off and you know eight nine at night when he's working on homework when he's confused. Uh, he's able to get replies back. He's got uh, connected. Uh, teachers that are are there to help and support, um, and it's those things that we've been talking about for so long that uh, I'm actually seeing play out. So I, th I I think to answer your question in a word, empowered. I think that's how it's affecting our students today. Uh, they are able to have better control over things. You know, for my son, he's involved in soccer, and so for him, it's 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 he's got a certain window of time when he can do homework and a certain window when he can't and, and he's he's not necessarily going to get to homework until maybe 8.30 or 9 at night and uh, he's going to be exhausted sometimes when he gets to it so uh, that flexibility really uh, really helps him in his own studies. He's still frustrated, he still hates homework that hasn't changed um, but uh, he's at least he has a little bit more control uh, in, in, in his choice of time and his use of device. That's a great example Mike and to your point a little bit and also to Brian's previous point, uh, we know that blended learning practices, maybe they weren't even called that before, but they've been around for at least several years now. It's definitely gaining traction, especially as schools are uh, more able to adapt technology and teachers are able to work technology more into their classroom practices. So from a teacher standpoint, um, and again, this is open to anyone, how, or I guess, what advice would you have for teachers who might be feeling possibly a little overwhelmed to go with the flow in adapting you know, blended learning and technology into their practice? Or what advice would you have for teachers who are maybe already started out and um, need to connect with others and, and figure out what works best as opposed to just going off their own experiments? So I, I'll, I'll kind of answer that by following up with Mike's comment about his son because I think it's really important to follow a student's perspective, right? So he talked about how his son is sharing Google Docs and different things with his dad, which is exciting in itself. Um, what will become even more exciting is when that teacher has the technology at his or her fingertips that can tell him or her how Mike's son is doing on a daily basis and then adjust the curriculum week to week based on his needs. And that technology is there, but teachers don't know how to use that. And the technology is not, well, let me just put it another way. The technology is there in general. It's not there specifically, so it's easy to use for teachers at this point. But when that teacher begins to personalize instruction on a weekly basis for Mike's son, then he gets even more engaged with his learning. Mike commented about he still doesn't like homework. Well, it's probably the type of homework he's receiving. Well, gee, imagine if he can go home and uh, do online Lego or do something in a makerspace or something along those lines that relate to his math class. I'll bet you that he would become a little more engaged in his learning and more anxious to do homework. Or if he had to go home and interview his parents on a Google Hangout like this and turn it in for an assignment learning about social studies in his classroom. You know, it's all of those tools are out there for teachers to use now, but it takes time to learn those things and to put those tools in the hands of teachers. When teachers are really doing that, that's, that's when we've really, you know, come around to really excite to be excited about learning and I'll just add that those kinds of things are happening in many schools across the US but we'd sure like to see them happening in every school and every classroom across the US. You know, one of the most interesting things about being a teacher and we all have all shared this are days when one of your lessons falls completely flat on his face and you have to punt. We've all gone through that 
and you know, that becomes one of your one of the tools in your in your toolbox. You learn how to punt, you learn how to recover and adapt, and then make that lesson better later. Now, when you add blended learning or Google Tools or Google Classroom, you name the skill. You add to the risk. And so, my advice for anyone listening is: well, be brave. You know, there's no reward without the risk. But before you do that, come prepared. You know, a great teacher is always prepared anyway. You you write those plans and then you fix them later. For me, it's networks. Having the right network to t uh, to tune into if you want to change, whether it's Q or iNACL or a Twitter feed, uh, there are different personal networks where you can steal ideas from the people working on those things. There's great conferences like the annual Q conference. You get 6,000 people talking about so many different ideas. You come away not just enthused, but you come away with, with ideas to steal and use on Monday morning. That's what we're hoping to give also for, from the e-learning strategy symposium. But, but the idea is this. You have to be brave. You have to prepare yourself. And you have to learn to gr grin and, and bear it when you fail, because failure is part of the process. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. Risk, risk is really a huge issue, and it's the one thing that our teachers talked about as really being the thing that was holding them back from trying more is that there's a risk involved, and that they felt there was a price to pay if things didn't go well. And we really had to keep talking to them about the fact that, yeah, as Brian said, we all ha we've all had lessons that fail, sometimes entire days that really don't go well. And, and it happens, and you you know how to recover from those. You figure it out. You, you, you develop a new plan. My kids learn the term sometimes things change and it just sometimes it has to change and that's okay um, but risk is huge and as we uh, you know get through each new wave of reasons why everyone's in panic whether it was no child left behind and now common core or whatever there's always a new reason to be freaked out about um, what you're supposed to be doing and the accountability for that and what's going to happen if your class doesn't measure up and if I'm not doing what everybody else is doing will my kids measure up and it's very difficult for a lot of teachers to have that faith to know that you're you're doing good pedagogy, you're you're doing good work, and that will pay off. That that does work. Um, just because you're doing it in a new way doesn't make it bad. It's just new. It's different, and we need to be better at sharing these success stories. Uh, we all have our own personal failure stories, but sharing those success stories and what made them successful so that teachers do see that there, there is hope here, there is a reason to do this, there is a measurable impact on student learning if it's done well. And, and just sharing that, that good stuff and helping them get connected to other people who are doing that good stuff and who have learned how to uh, either fake it or change it when things don't go well. Uh, to help build on on where they are and keep them moving forward. That's a great point, Adina. And hopefully, at the end of this, we'll be able to hear from each of you in terms of your recommended, you know, either resources or communities that are kind of your go-to's for learning more about blended learning or getting better at blended learning. I did want to take a moment, real quick, to address a question from Patrick on Google Plus and. Thanks for tuning in, Patrick. Uh, has this general question um, that ties into one of our own that we had prior to this conversation that we wanted to ask. Uh, what are some of maybe the common challenges or issues that you've all seen with trying to implement blended learning? And Patrick brings up the specific one of uh, perhaps there's a hindrance of physical school environments and the constraints involved there. And how have you seen either admins or teachers kind of working through those challenges or, or working around those issues? I'll, I'll jump into that one and first say um, that it's fun to have Patrick as part of this. Uh, Patrick lives in Hawaii and the rest of us are in California. And imagine this kind of experience happening in classrooms across the United States, whether it's a kindergarten classroom or a high school teacher in a history class interacting with their state representative this way. That's the power of what we're doing here. So, John, a shout out to you and your team for doing this because that's pretty exciting. And now to kind of answer that question, uh, what was the question I just was flashing on? How important that part was. Ask your question again, sorry. 
Yeah, no problem. What are some of the common challenges or issues that you've seen with schools oh, right. just trying to implement specifically right. physical school environments? So that goes back to the leadership. You can't change the timing of the school day without leadership at the top of your school. So that is, you know, if you're a teacher, that means nudging your department chair or nudging your principal and saying, hey, you know, it might work this way or going to conferences like Q or other places and visiting and going, oh, this is how they've done it in a neighboring school district. Um, so it just nudges. I, I like to tell people that blended learning is a top down and a bottom up solution and it's got to go both ways for it to be really effective. I would add that um, yes, it's got to be leadership and administration, but there are things you can do within your own classroom. Um, there's a lot of teachers out there that have adopted a 20% time model that uh, was made famous by Google, was innovated by 3M and HP, where you give students 20% uh, of the school, their school time to work on projects that, are, that they're passionate about. And that could extend beyond the four walls of the classroom. That could become something that's a blended learning activity and you could engage the community. You could try to change something in your, in your, local, in your local area. There's a lot of great things going on in that, in that space. Um, that has also sort of birthed this other concept of genius hour um, that's, that's, that's related to 20% time. And I've been reading a book by Dan Wetrick called Pure Genius, and it, and it sort of extends upon that idea of genius hour. So are, there are things you can do as an individual teacher to carve out time to, uh, to break out beyond those four walls of the classroom and do some creative things. The other point I would mention about Patrick's question that's related was, was he said, when do you see folks having time within the regular school day, what with bell schedules and everything, um, to engage in this kinds of these kinds of professional learning opportunities? And I think I would point to a lot of educators use the evening time as they're grading. They set it aside and they jump onto Twitter. There's these things called Twitter chats. In California, ours is Sunday nights at 8 p.m., and I'm convinced it's, it's a non-parent that runs it because that's like witching hour for me with our kids. But anyway, 8 to 9 p.m. Pacific uh, on Sunday, it's California Ed Chat, so C-A-E-D-C-H-A-T. Look up and see if there's an Ed Chat in your state. Look up and see if you want to participate in the national, uh, I guess, international Ed Chat, which is on Tuesdays, twice uh, on Tuesdays, um, and participate there. Folks are carving out little windows of time during their prep periods, during lunch. Um, uh, there are teachers that are having students engage in their 20% time, and that's when they, as a teacher, jump into these kinds of conversations, and they'll have what are called brown bag lunches, where they, uh, they eat in their classroom, and they jump into a webinar that's scheduled that happens to fit with their, their lunch break. And there's so many out there that you can usually find one that happens to fit to your schedule. Uh, it's one of those things that can expand to fill the available time. So to answer the question about leaders and teachers trying to find time to, to jump in and be lifelong learners, we find time. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many Q members that volunteer their time and jump in and learn um, at the craziest times of the day. And so um, my work is interacting with them on a, on a regular basis, and, and I'll get pings all hours of the day and night. Uh, people are always looking to learn, and, and we'll find that opportunity and we'll make it possible. So... Um, I think there are also a lot of examples to, to go back to the, uh, the restraints question, the hindrances of the physical school environments. There's a lot of amazing experiences, uh, experiments rather, I should say, happening in public schools, happening in private schools, happening in public charter schools. Um, you know, I'm amazed Rob hasn't talked about his own online school that he ran for a while. There's a lot of experiments, a lot of uh, things that are changing to allow for blended learning to have a bigger role and allow for student-centered learning. Um, to really take hold. So, uh, you know, I know it's not everywhere. It's like one of my favorite authors, William Gibson, has said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, there are amazing examples of uh, innovation in education uh, where these types of things are happening. Um, it just may not be in your school. It may not be in your, your district. So the challenge there is, back to Brian's point, be brave. Maybe it could be you. Maybe you could lead that charge and start doing something different and be that ground up, sort of bottom up uh, change that we want to see. So I'll stop talking now. You know, from the, the leadership side, it, I think it becomes part of part of what you have to do is as a scheduled piece of your day. I know for um, my department uh, with our, our, our TOSAs and the other uh, EdTech coordinator, it, it has to be part of what we put on our calendar as a scheduled time. That this is the time I'm going to dedicate to 
um, to connecting, to che get, checking in on Google Plus or on Twitter or on blogs that I follow or what have you and seeing what's out there that if we don't actually, for us, if we don't actually schedule it, then it doesn't happen during the day and then it becomes something you're having to do on your off hours and folks uh, have, have talked about wanting to still have that balance of, of, of home and work and not feeling like they're always doing work stuff. And for some of us that we're okay with that and with others, they're not. So um, for some people, they, they need to schedule it in. As, as a classroom teacher, it might be something that you include it as part of your prep and consider it part of your prep time, um, whether it's a scheduled time during the day or during your prep time before or after school that you're going to spend, even if it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, part of how you prepare to teach your students needs to be keeping up with what's going on, connecting with others, um, bouncing ideas off other folks. I think that has to be a critical piece now or else I, I don't think we can effectively do our jobs anymore without, without doing that, that connection um, and, and learning about best practices. It just has to be a, a piece of what we do as part of our day. And I should probably add there's a third category of person where we're okay with it but maybe our spouse is not. Um, that's probably a, a large percentage of us actually. <laughs> Happy wife, happy life, right? <laughs> so we are getting close to the top of our hour, and as usually happens here, 60 minutes just absolutely flies by. But while we still do have a few minutes, I did want to, again, from each of you, get your recommendations on either resources that are kind of your go-to for learning more about blended learning. Um, and again, that could be personal or that could be for... Uh, advice for someone who's kind of just starting down the path and then also I wanted to touch on if you had any recommendations for communities um, that you think people should be a part of where they can you know connect with some fellow educators who might be in the the same space and same mindset so let's go ahead and do what we did at the top of the hour and we'll just go down the line again left to right so Adina do you wanna go ahead and start us off uh, sure so I think mine first are, are kind of general ideas. Um, getting involved in, you know, pick your poison, whether it's Google Plus or whether it's Twitter. Um, I started on Classroom 2.0, seems like forever ago now, and that was my kickoff. But getting involved in at least one space where there are other educators talking about the types of things that, that you want to talk about, um, whether it's joining a particular community or just being on there in general, sort of following a few folks. And, and get into it bit by bit. Um, I, I find also I, I, uh, I teach for leading edge certification, helping uh, teachers become certified and becoming online and blended uh, teachers. And I, I think it's a really great way to kind of get into it, learn more. A lot of folks think they know what it's all about and they get into the course and realize, oh, there's a lot more they just weren't aware of that, that needed to be there. Um, so it's a getting involved in, in something like that um, or at least talking to people who've been through it um, and learning what it's really all about and um, I, I need Cole as well. Um, really getting involved, taking a look at the resources and materials that are there for you. I think we have a common theme for the rest of us. Uh, it, it's so funny. It's, as Rob and I have looked at, at districts who are, are trying online and blended learning, uh, the worst examples are those districts that say, yeah, we're going to create a year-long course, and we're going to do this over the summer, and we're going to start in September, and you just know they're going to fall flat on their face because we know how hard it is to create curriculum for a face-to-face -face class. Creating something that's online and blended with a pedagogical shift takes much longer. So just as Adina was saying, it's always best to start small. Start at the lesson level. Find a personal network. Go to a conference. Find a, a, a teacher partner in your school or in your district or in the county over so that you can create these things together. You can share the workload. You can learn together. Having those personal learning networks, starting with little bites and expanding from there is the easiest way to succeed. I think I'm next to him. Um, so Brian stole a little bit of my thunder. I would just uh, add, get a buddy. Uh, you know, in the spirit of blended learning, it's going to be online in the spaces that Adina mentioned, Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or Classroom 2.0. Uh, but it's also going to be face-to-face. -face. 
And if you can find someone that's nearby you, maybe not the teacher next door, but maybe the teacher across town, maybe a teacher in a different department, find somebody else that you can you can participate on this journey with. If you have that buddy, then you've got someone you can bounce ideas off of, you can have shared experiences, take them with you to the conference you want to go to, um, and, and then reflect together. Um, I, I, we've already found just in student learning that the shared experience is a, is a better uh, educational experience because what you do when you learn together is you talk to each other about what you're learning. You're able to process, you're able to reflect, you're able to challenge each other. Well, I don't think that would work in our school. Really? Why wouldn't it? Okay. And then you have these conversations. So, um, it, And it really does embody the spirit of blended because you've got that face-to-face -face connection and you've got the uh, online PLN as well. Uh, it also adds a level of accountability, right? If, if Brian and I, have, can, he's going to be my learning buddy and I'm not Twitter, you know, on Twitter, and I'm not posting things, and I'm not learning, he's going to challenge me and say, hey, I thought we were going to go on this journey together. And I would go, you're right, I'm sorry, okay, let me jump on board and get, get back into that thing. We know educators are all busy. We know that we've got, you know, scads of things that we're asked to do, and it seems to be more every year that teachers are expected to be for every student. Um, so I would say that the answer to that is to reach out and be a learner yourself and constantly grow and develop. And if you get that buddy and you go to learn together, I think you're in a much better place to succeed. So um, I would just say back to everybody that the power is in you and that there are no excuses to not be a connected educator today. There are just no excuses. There's so many free resources, so many opportunities. Um, I've heard Mike share that quote about from William Gibson about the future being now and it caused me to think about back in the second Star Wars movie where Yoda says to Luke um, do or do not there is no try so I would just say to everybody out, out there go do it that is a perfect note to end on Rob and as you can see kind of over my shoulder Star Wars is always welcome in this particular series so <laughs> But you gotta do the voice, Rob. Do or do not. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I'm not good at voices. I just remember that quote, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> you don't buy my size, do you? <laughs> oh, good. I'll get I'll get Mike to to be my spokesperson in the future. There you go. Well, again, thank you everyone for taking the time, energy, and the insights to to share with everybody today and. Uh, our hour is pretty much up here, but just because our conversation is ending right here doesn't mean that the general conversation has to fall flat. We're going to have a full video recording of this webinar up immediately on www.connectedlearning.tv with other curated content on the way that you can share with your networks. And we also encourage everyone to get involved in the ongoing conversations both on Twitter using the hashtag CE14 and also on Google Plus within the Connected Learning community. And again, if you found this conversation helpful, please share it around with your networks and encourage them to get involved uh, in the Connected Educators community. And as a reminder, and I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, this year Connected Educator Month went global, went international, and everyone can help turn one month of events into a year-long opportunity for educators to connect with and support one another. So I hope you'll consider donating to the CrowdRise campaign, and that's www.crowdrise.com slash Connected Educator Month. And you can also sign up for the Connected Educator newsletter at connecteducators.org. And speaking of newsletters, if you like to be informed of more webinars that are coming up in the Connected Learning TV series, again, you can visit the website www.connectedlearning.tv and sign up for the email newsletter there. So again, thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you again soon on Connected Learning TV.